Um, welcome everybody um, to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh's introduction to uh, imaging, astroimaging, part four. Um, if you've missed any of the um, other instalments, you can find links to them, I think, on all our uh, portals. So you can either go to the website, uh, look on the Facebook page, our Twitter account, and we now have our own uh, YouTube account. So um, you can actually access it directly on, on YouTube um, with that name. We've attempted to make this quite large subject digestible by putting it into smallish pieces. Although Mark has a fairly large plateful tonight, so uh, <laughs> he's done an excellent job in a relatively short time, I think, to, uh, to, get, to get together what he has. I put the next slide, Mark. So um, it's really going to be about, about uh, long exposure and deep sky imaging. Um, Mark will talk about equipment, uh, sort of different targets, what suits what in that sense, uh, capture techniques in the software. And then I think we're going to have a, a live demo or two. And then, uh, then we'll talk about next time. So um, over to you then, Mark. Hey, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I should just say that this is an intro to astro imaging. So, and as this particular one is a huge subject, uh, hopefully I'll introduce you to all the different concepts that we're not going to be able to go into anything in too much detail. So if you want to know more or um, get help doing it, then the answer is to join society and join our imaging group. So all the members of the imaging group here will know all of this anyway. Nothing's going to be very new. There's no, there's no magic, yeah, right. magic trick here today, I'm afraid. It's just about being consistent and getting it all right, I think. Um, so um, long exposure deep sky imaging, what is it? Um, that doesn't work, that does. It's about taking pictures of these sorts of objects, really. Uh, we've all seen the glossy pictures of it and we'd all quite like to do it. Um, and it is possible to do it because these are all taken from Edinburgh or the edge of Edinburgh. Um, so with a bit of practice and some of the right equipment, you can actually do that yourself. Why do we want to do it? Well, it's cool, actually. <laughs> it's just fun. Um, but I mean, Peter introduced us a, a few weeks ago to buying a bit of time on a robotic telescope somewhere nice in the Canaries or whatever, and taking some nice pictures that way. But I think it's far more satisfying using your own kit from your own back garden uh, with all the um, problems that we have in Scotland, fighting the Scottish skies and the weather. Um, and when you get your first image, no matter how bad, and my first images were really bad, um, and it doesn't matter how good other people's images are, yours is still the best. It's so exciting when you get your first images out there. So I think the challenge of um, deep sky imaging is in itself is, is just worth it. So long exposure imaging, what we're talking about. In the past, we've talked about short exposures, but really we're talking now images from one minute to five minutes or even longer. Um, we're talking about stacking um, lots of frames, at least five to 50 frames, really. And we talked about stacking a couple of uh, meetings ago as well. And we're reducing the noise that way. We're going to calibrate those light frames um, using darks to get rid of thermal noise, flats to get rid of um, vignetting um, and dust, which I'll discuss a bit more, and uh, bias frames to get rid of uh, noise associated with your, your sensor being imperfect. We'll be talking about um, tracking, um, following the stars in the sky or auto guiding. We're going to have to deal with light pollution somehow because we have a fair bit of that in Edinburgh. And uh, we're not going to cover this tonight, but um, one of the things you might want to do is dith dithering because um, sensors are imperfect. And if um, the image is in exactly the same place each time, then those imperfections stack up and you end up seeing more of them. So you you move those imperfections around your sensor a little bit and that's called dithering amongst other things. Um, I'll just quickly go over this again from part two, I think it was, um, what stacking is. The whole point of stacking more than one, one of your frames is to um, increase the signal to noise ratio. You want lots of signal and as little noise as you can for the best images. Um, 
and I've said this before, get your head around noise and stacking if you can, because I think it's very important for understanding how to get the best um, images. Uh, so the actual, actual object, you're trying to images on, on every frame, but the noise is random on every frame. So the noise sort of averages out and the signal itself, the object increases over time. And up to a point, the more you stack, the better you get. Even a few frames makes a, a big difference. Recapping on noise as well, there's various sources of noise. So your random shot noise, the stuff that just sort of arrives as you're shooting the images, and that's what stacking mostly gets rid of by averaging that out. Let's see people in. Um, thermal noise, we're using darks for that, and we're going to cool the camera as well. The heat of the day and the heat in the camera, that all causes noise as well. And if you can cool your camera, you can get rid of that even better. Read noise, that affects faint signals and short exposures. We talked about that when we did um, electrically assisted astronomy, electronically assisted astronomy. Um, we're not going to be using such short exposures now, so the read noise is less of an issue, uh, but it is still there. And the sensor noise, the imperfections, so we're going to use bias, darks and flats for, for all of those things. Yeah. And recapping on exposures, is, again, again, because um, we're often asked, what exposures did you use? Or what exposure should I use for that? Uh, very difficult to answer that. Um, briefly, the noise is, proportion, is equal to the, the root of the, the signal. So as you can see from this graph, along the bottom, it's the number of frames. Um, the blue line, as you add frames, increases pretty linearly. Um, as you start to add a few frames in, the noise starts to plateau and level out. Um, it doesn't, you, you don't totally carry on. It doesn't, the noise doesn't disappear the more you add forever, but it's a, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, few long exposures or many short exposures. Um, EAA, we use lots of short exposures. In this case, we're using longer exposures and fewer of them. Uh, so the read noise is not as important. If we go too far in terms of our exposures, um, anywhere with light pollution, you're going to end up with an image very much like that. You can still extract data from that. I'm amazed at how much data Mike manages to get out of his light polluted images with star tools. It does drag a lot out, but the more um, pulling out of the data you have to do, the more noise you're going to introduce in your final images as well. So there's a balance between how much light pollution you can cope with and how long your exposures are. Um, I won't go through this very much, but a thousand one second exposures is not the same as one one thousand exposure. Part of that's about read noise and dynamic range and so on. Um, but an exposure for um, the M42 um, Orion Nebula might only be one minute, whereas for a faint galaxy like M51, you might need four minute exposures. So the exposure does depend on the object you're looking at. Um, one minute for the Orion Nebula is is more than enough for for a lot of a lot of cases. Four minutes is probably not not enough for the Whirlpool Galaxy. CCDs seem to work better with longer exposures, and CMOS cameras seem to work better with um, shorter exposures. I don't know if there's any science related to that, but that's anecdotally anyway. And um, yeah, we discussed game before as well. So there's no easy rule for exposures. Um, it's all determined by the object you're looking at, the conditions of the sky, the weather, the, um, how clear it is, the light pollution, how much time you have available as well. If you haven't got the time to do it, you might want to do a few shorter exposures. Um, what your camera's like, your optics, your mount, how good it is at tracking, what filters you're using, um, the temperature and so on. So I think when it comes to exposures, you, you'll soon get a, a feeling for, for what's going to work for you, for your camera, for your telescope, for the objects you're looking at. And eventually you'll, you'll, you'll come up with a, a set that, of exposures that work for the sorts of objects you're looking at. So I, I will tend to do um, three minute exposures for some of the two, two or three minute exposures for some of the brighter objects um, and probably go down to five minute for some of the fainter ones. I find that beyond that, light pollution uh, gets in the way too much and it's harder to pull the data out and introduces more noise and lots more gradients in the, in the image that are harder to remove. 
Okay, a few basics on image capture. Um, tracking, we need to track the star. Obviously the Earth rotates and so the stars appear to rotate around the pole, fairly obvious stuff. Um, so really we're talking about an equ equatorial mount that, that we need that's accurately aligned with the pole. The better the alignment, um, the better the tracking is gonna be. You can use an altazimuth mount, but you need something like a field or camera rotator because if you use an um, altazimuth mount for any long exposures, the object's going to rotate within the field of view and it's going to blur and smear over the image. You can get them, they're not cheap. In fact, I think most of the large telescopes in the, in the world are actually altazimuths. Well, I think all of them are there, all the, all, the, all the new ones are altazimuths and they'll have some form of field rotation in there because it's, it's Quite hard to build equatorial mounts of the size of telescopes that we're, we're building now. So in theory the motor just needs to track the stars in right ascension um, and the, the up and down movement the declination stays the same because that's all taken care of by your polar alignment. In practice um, it's never quite that straightforward and you'll have to sometimes guide in declination as well. Um, longer exposures and, and what that means depends on your field of view and um, your mount and, and your camera. Uh, it could mean you might, might be able to get a, an exposure for one minute without um, auto guiding, just tracking. It might be you can do two or three minutes. Um, Mike certainly does very long exposures with his. I think he has the best HEQ5 mount in the world. Uh, but he also has a, a wide field of view so that so the imperfections caused by the guiding are less obvious. Uh, for my telescope where it's a about twice the focal length, I can't go much beyond a, a minute exposure without starting to see trailing, and I need to auto guide after that. So auto guiding, briefly what that is, um, basically a separate telescope sitting on the back of um, the main telescope with another camera there, piggybacked as we call it, and um, the, the idea is you keep the star, a guide star centered in that second telescope you do that by sending um, commands to the mount to keep to, to move to keep that star centered and that way if it's in the center of the guide scope of the guide camera the object you're photographing should be at the center of um, your, your camera and main telescope as well uh, that's a piggy mac camera uh, a piggy mac uh, telescope and camera that's what something similar looks like on mine so that's just a cheapy 70 millimeter refractor with my lunar planetary camera on there in some um, some some tube rings and with some very bad cable management for the the dew heater to keep it keep the lens from fogging up and that works pretty well. Um, the other option is something called an off-axis guider, which I, I've tried in the past and without too much success. Uh, in theory, it could be a better way of guiding because um, with a, a piggyback a telescope system you can get flexure between the guide scope and the main telescope and that can cause um, stars appear to move in the in the main telescope uh, in practice i've not actually seen any of that um, an off-axis guider it takes off a little bit of light from the from the uh, cone coming in from the telescope at right angles and sends it to a, another guide camera there and there shouldn't be any flexure between that um, but the problem with that is you're only taking off a small amount of light so it can sometimes be hard to find a guide, guide star to, to, to guide on. You can rotate it, um, but still it can be, be harder to do that. Uh, but a lot of people use um, off-axis guiders as well. I find piggyback guiding the, the easiest for me anyway. This is a piece of software we use for auto-guiding, which you may have seen before, PHD2. PhD stands for push here dummy, which is it's meant to be press this button and all the auto guiding is done for you. And to some extent it is, um, it's not quite that simple. Um, but over here on the left, we've got um, the field of view of the guide camera with all the stars in there. Um, the guide software has chosen this star to guide on. It decides it's the, it's the right sort of brightness and dimensions to guide on. Over here is a, a close-up of the star it's guiding on. As you can see, it's pretty fuzzy. This is the profile of the star here, but it's certainly good enough to do sub sub pixel guiding on. And it will keep the edge of the star in the, the center of the crosshairs there by sending commands to the telescope mount. And down here, the, the red and blue lines are the commands sent to the telescope mount. Uh, the red in declination, the blue right ascension. 
and it's clever enough to learn. So after a few minutes sending these commands, it's learned that um, I can do it in a different way and it's starting to smooth out. So here I was probably guiding to about um, an arc second. By the time I get to here, we're probably guiding to less than half an arc second actually, which is, is pretty good for here. Um, the line across the top yellow and white lines, that's the brightness of the guide star. So if you see that dropping, it usually means there's some light cloud going over it, or in some cases it totally disappears and then you get red lights flashing up to tell you it's lost guiding and so on. There's a few things you can adjust here about the aggressiveness of the guiding and so on, but it's um, pretty straightforward. You find a guide star and press the button and it starts. This is the sort of target um, where the stars appear in a, in a sort of one arc second circle. The idea is if it's over here, that the star appears over here, then you bring it back to the center. One other thing to note, um, down at the bottom, you can see the four second exposure. So I'm, I'm only guiding every four seconds. I used to guide every half a second, which you can do. If I can, you can send guide signals every fraction of a second if you want to. The problem with that is you end up chasing the atmospheric seeing. So the stars jumping around every fraction of a second and you're trying to uh, keep it centered. But in reality, it was still in the same place. It's just the atmosphere that's moved it slightly. So if you your exposures are four seconds long, then it averages all that sort of stuff out and you're not ending up chasing the atmospheric effects. It also means you can guide on much fainter stars as well because you're taking four seconds exposures and um, you'll really be short of a, of a guide star in that case. So that's just a brief rundown of auto guiding, which some of you may do, some of you are, uh, I know are wanting to get into. Um, it, sometimes it's easy and it just works, other times it doesn't, and you can bang your head against the wall and try and work out why. But it's, it's soluble. But PhD2 is the one. There is another free one called Meta Guide, which I've had some success with in the past, but I think, I think everyone agrees this is probably the easiest. It may not be the best, it's, it's the easiest to use them. <clears throat> Mounts for imaging. Um, this is very important. Um, I think I would argue that you should spend more on your mount than your telescope tube to start with, certainly. Um, if your mount's not stable, it doesn't track well, then it's going to be head banging stuff to get it working. If every time you go near it or breathe on it, the, the object moves or wobbles or whatever it happens to be, uh, you're going to find it really hard to get good images and going to end up um, losing a lot of your, your subframes. Um, even the wind will affect that as well. So a nice solid mount is, is, is worth having and worth paying for. Um, ATQ5, around about 700, 800 quid, I think. There's a few people got that and, and they're really well regarded. Uh, for what you get, it's not actually a lot of money. It's, it's the one at the top there. I know a few people have that. Um, I've got a slightly bigger one, the EQ6R, which is pretty much the same telescope, just got a, a larger payload. Um, lots of manufacturers, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, you can pay anything from a few hundred pounds to many thousands of pounds. If you've got a big budget, go and buy a Paramount and spend 15 to 20,000 pounds on one. Have a fully robotic observatory. That's what this is down here. Uh, but I'm not in that ballpark. That's my mount. Uh, it's an EQ6R. And that's carrying a 10 inch Newtonian. I think that's probably as much as that mount would happily take for imaging. It, if, you, if the payload capability of your mount says something like 20 kilograms, then for imaging, you'd probably want to put no more than 15 kilograms on. If you're just doing visual observing, you can carry more. But um, for imaging, you need to be under under the maximum payload limit, really. You want extra stability. I think that mount would take a 12-inch Newtonian, but I wouldn't use it for imaging on there, I don't think. Okay, image capture. Ah, you've got to connect your camera to the telescope, whatever your camera happens to be. Um, there's no easy answer for that either. If you've got a DSLR, as we've shown before, you need a T-ring and a T-connector. Um, DSLRs almost always need a bit of extra back focus, so you might need an extra extension tube in there. Uh, but depending on your telescope and your, your camera, you'll need something slightly different. A lot of cameras come with the, the right connectors and extension tubes. No, not all of them do though. Uh, I'm sure you're, the person you want the camera or telescope from can help you on that one. Um, 
light pollution filter, you might want to put one of those in the optical train as well. Um, if you've still got a lot of sodium, orange sodium street lights around, that's relatively easy to filter out because that's a, a very narrow wavelength. But um, unfortunately, the new LED street lights make that difficult because it's shining all the way across the spectrum. So if you filter that out, you've probably filtered out the object as well. And you won't see that. There are now some um, light pollution filters that claim to filter out the LED lights more. I'm not quite sure how that works, but anyone fancy getting one and tell me how it works, that'd be good. Um, you might want to put a focal reducer in the optical train. So if you've got a something like a ten, an eight inch F10 Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, um, for certainly for the, the, the wider deep sky um, objects, you need to reduce that from F10. That's that's too to um, high magnification. So these reduce them to about 6.3, and that's more reasonable. Um, focusing is far more critical now than, than visual. Um, if you are, you know that, if you are um, imaging, then you will see imperfections in your focus far more. They all, it comes out far more. So if you've got a, a 10 to one reduction in your focuser, this one has at the top, you can see a sort of, um, gold colored um knob up there that's the 10 to 1 reduction but what i've also got on here is um a motor focus controller as well and they are they are brilliant so if you're sitting at your laptop and trying to get your object in focus and then you have to keep running backwards and forwards with the telescope to adjust the focus it's quite hard work if you can sit at um, your laptop look at the image on the screen and press a few buttons and it changes the focus or even automatically focuses for you and that's really good. This is a new one I got recently. It's, it's ZWO EAF, and um, it, it's brilliant actually. Uh, I've not had a chance to use it in too much detail yet, but it seems to work really well. And to help you with the focus, a batten off mask. If you haven't used one of these before, these are invaluable as well. It's a strangely shaped mask that goes on the front of your telescope and gives you um, a star pattern, like something like that on a bright star one in the center where the pattern is correct it means it's the focus on either side. It's just slightly out of focus. It's quite fine uh, differences, but it is actually visible and it does make it really easy. And sub software actually reads these patterns as well. APT does that and tells you how far out of focus you are. So it's called batting off grabber. And as I said before, if it's not in focus, get it right or don't bother go to bed it's not it's not worth the hassle because you get up in the morning and try and process your data and it's all fuzzy and you've wasted your night so um, do it right <laughs> don't bother cameras for imaging um you'll be aware of a lot of them um a lot of cmos ones are around now far fewer ccd cameras there won't be too many ccds left in a while because i don't think many people are manufacturing the ccd chips so CMOS has taken over now. Um, CCDs still have their place, but very shortly CMOS will be the only ones you can get really. DSLRs, uh, they're great for um, deep sky imaging as well. That's how I started off and some great pictures using a DSLR and you can get it modified for astronomical use. By default, the DSLR has a, a filter in front of the sensor, which is there to, to filter out infrared light to keep the keep it sharp. Unfortunately, it also filters out hydrogen alpha wavelengths as well, which is one of the most important um, wavelengths for astronomical objects. Um, a lot of the, the nebulae shine in hydrogen alpha. That's a lot of the universe is made of hydrogen atoms. So um, you don't wanna filter that out. So you can get that replaced for a couple of hundred quid and replaced with something that still filters out the infrared, but not the um, hydrogen alpha and you can pay anything from a few hundred pounds to a lot of thousands of pounds really uh, but that sort of range for the for the amateur amateur imager really if you can get one that's cool that's even better because you can cool it to something like minus 10 minus 20 degrees c and that takes away a lot of the thermal noise and really does make a, a huge difference the difference between with my camera between zero degrees and minus 10 is dramatic. There's so many more hot pixels uh, at zero and hardly any at uh, minus 10. Do you choose a color camera or a mono camera? This has been a, a long running debate for a lot of people. 
it's certainly simpler to get um, a nice image very quickly and easily with a with a um, a color camera. And if that's what you're after, making nice images, it's probably still the best way. Some people, myself included, would would argue that if you use a mono camera and take your images through red, green, blue filters separately, you can ultimately get uh, better results, but it's a lot more work. Um, and some nights, if you get your red and your green images, and then it clouds over for your blue images, you're left with a str very strange colored uh, image. So maybe in Scotland, the color camera is, is the most sensible option there. Um, the mono camera is, possible, is probably better for doing science um, experiments, science um, research and imaging as well. Um, the benefit of a mono camera and RGB filters is that it naturally reduces the light pollution um, because you're imaging in very narrow regions of the spectrum. It does actually cut out a lot of other stuff. And some of the, um, the worst polluting uh, wavelengths are in the gaps or are, are less sensitive. It doesn't totally get rid of it, but it, it can help. You do want to match your camera to your telescope. Um, and what that means is um, aim to get one to two arc seconds for every pixel on your camera. Um, and that's a function of the size of the pixels on the camera and the focal length of your telescope. Um, I'll show you later on how you can, you can work that out. But um, if you do it too much more than that, if it's say four or five arc seconds per pixel, then you'll end up with square stars. And if you do less than one, then um, you may be losing, uh, you won't get any more resolution. So you may be losing some light there. And um, you can image in um, narrowband filters, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two, um, with both mono and um, color cameras, although it's better in mono by far because you're not already filtering through color filters. Um, these are the sorts of cameras that you'll have seen. And, and it's um, interesting to, to remember that um, color cameras are actually mono chips in the first place. All that happens is there's a colored um, Bayer filter put in front of it with red, green, blue, and green again. Um, filters put in front of the, the pixels. So it takes four um, mono pixels to create one color pixel in the end, but it's, it's not quite as, as low resolution as that. Um, so you are just putting colored filters in the same way that you do over a mono CCD. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the filters you will use over a mono um, CCD will be better quality than the ones that are on your CMOS color chip. What telescope should you get for imaging? Um, well, it depends what you want to image really, because no one telescope will do them all equally well. So you want to choose your focal length and your F ratio based on what you want to do. Are you looking at to doing wide field images of larger objects um, or close-ups? So nebulae and um, clusters might require a wide field, planets and galaxies, maybe a, a narrow field. So as an example, something like a three or four inch F5 to seven refractor will give you a nice uh, wide field um, imaging view. Um, schmidt cassegrain grains uh, um, are actually naturally F10, but with the reducer, you can go at F6.3. So you can do both there with close-ups at um, F10 and wide field at F6.3. And I, I think one of the, the most versatile telescopes of all is something like an 8 inch F5 Newtonian, which I had for a, a long time. And they cover most things pretty well, I would, I would say. Um, you can do a lot of wide field stuff, but you can also get pretty close in on some things as well. So if you're looking for a, a catch-all telescope that's not too expensive, I think that's a, a brilliant compromise. And uh, yeah, these are the sort of things. So how do you choose which objects you should image at night? So going out there and, and, and thinking, um, I'll just point it and something is, is probably going to end up with something pointless at the end. So it's usually a good idea to, to plan what you're going to look at. And there's um, a nice calculator you can use online on astronomy tools about the field of view. If you use the Clear Outside app from First Light Optics, this is also linked to on that same website. You can find it there. So if you're looking at for a wider field, 
a view of uh, things like the Orion Nebula, North American Nebula, some of the, the larger galaxies like Andromeda and Triangulum, and some of the bigger clusters like the Pleiades and globular clusters are fairly wide, but also fairly narrow as well. Your narrower field of view telescopes will be good for most galaxies, certainly the smaller ones. Planetary nebulae, like the Ring Nebula, are pretty small in the sky, so you really want to be fairly close in, otherwise they can end up looking like just another star. And globular clusters are uh, very nice in that as well. So here's what that field of view calculator looks like. If you haven't used it before, it's worth uh, having a look at. So it's set to imaging mode. I want to look what the Andromeda galaxy looks like in my telescope. So I put in, chosen my telescope, uh, a 10 inch Newtonian. Um, it's plugged in the focal length and aperture for me. It knew which one it was. I plugged in the camera and it's filled in the resolution and the pixel size for me. So down here, it's shown that my focal ratio is f4.8. Um, that hides. Um, the resolution is 0.78 arc seconds per pixel. I said we should get that between one and two. I've broken the rule straight away. Um, but some, some things I've worked on, it's nice to have a slightly higher resolution than, than necessary, but it's mostly it's not necessary. Um, if I set my binning to two by two, then that goes up to something like one and a half arc seconds per pixel, which is much more reasonable. The field of view shows up around about a half a degree, which is um, not great for some of the wider objects, but it's great for things like galaxies and, um, and planetary nebula and so on. Um, so that's how it looks for, for my telescope. What that means, it, it shows something like this. So the red box is my telescope camera combination and that shows what I should be able to image on the, on the um, Andromeda galaxy. And I did that and that's pretty much what I, what I did. So my telescope's not great for the Andromeda galax galaxy because it's missing such a lot of the object. However, it's still a reason to, to image it because it shows up lots of really nice detail in the, in, in the dust clouds that uh, are going around the Andromeda galaxy. It shows up some detail quite nicely. So even though it's not great to see the whole thing, it can still come up with some nice um, detail. But for something like M101, the pinwheel galaxy, it looks like my telescope would be perfect for that. Frames it quite nicely, a bit of space around the outside, but the object filling it very nicely. And that is pretty much what it, what it did. So um, for my telescope, something like M101 is perfect, really. The Orion Nebula again, um, it's showing I, I will be able to get the core of the nebula, but there's an awful lot of nebulosity around about it, including the Running Man Nebula up here. That it won't come close to, and that's exactly what it is. It's showing the core areas. There's an awful lot more nebulosity around about it. But again, one of the good things you can do by looking close in is you can actually see the trapezium, which is the, the four stars that um, ionize all the gases in the Orion Nebula and make it glow like that. So again, there's still a, a place for something close in like that. Okay, uh, um, I chose Mike's um, telescope and camera, or the camera that he had until a, a few days ago when he's got a new one, uh, to, to show a, a different um, setup. So in this one, it's a 100 millimeter uh, refractor, a focal ratio of f5.5, so that's quite a wide field of view. As you can see, it's about um, 2.3 by 1.5 degrees field of view, which is quite a lot larger than mine. The resolution is 1.6 arc seconds per pixel, which is just about perfect, really. And the camera is a, a Canon 600D, which I think you had modified for um, astronomy, had the filter replaced as well. Didn't you? So what that would show up for him is that the Orion Nebula would be perfect um, and even fitting in the Running Man Nebula as well. This red box is mine, this yellow box is the other telescope and it, 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 it frames it very nicely. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy, if you rotate the, the camera, would fit in also very nicely. Um, and Mike did that and came up with a very nice picture that filled the whole field of view, which is great. Um, M101, slightly more lost in, in the field of view, um, but still very nice. Um, you can crop in on that and there are enough pixels in that camera that it would actually still come up as a as a nice image. 
If you get to smaller galaxies though, like M86, that really will be lost in the field of view. However, what you do get with a large field of view on galaxies is you get to see lots more galaxies. So I think that's the Mokarian chain, all the galaxies, um, and there are loads of galaxies on there. And that's a really neat image. So um, wide field telescopes do have a place for galaxies as well. Thank you for those, Mike. Image capture software. Um, you don't actually need it, I suppose. If you've got something like a DSLR with a memory card in it, you can get yourself a nice remote cable release and just click away and take photographs and store them on your camera. But um, that can only go so far. At some point, you'll want to start using some software to capture your images. And there are many available. Um, a lot of them are free or cheap. Some are very expensive, but the ones I've looked at are mostly free or very cheap. The one I prefer is APT, Astrophotography Tool. That's only about 18 euros to buy, and then five euros a year, I think, to, to keep getting the upgrades, and it's definitely worth it. Um, it's got loads of features in it. It's got everything you could possibly want. It's been around a while, and they're very good at supporting it. It is purely Windows. A new, a new kid on the block, Nina. Uh, again, it's very full featured, but it's not as stable yet. I've tried it a few times and had a few problems with it, but I think it could become a really good one. Uh, something to watch for the future. Again, only for Windows. And something from France, CCD CL. That is also um, very new and free and cross-platform. So that's, that's, that's something in its favor. Again, very, very full free featured. It can do all the things that APT can do as well. Um, also had a few problems with, with that when I tried it out recently, but that too will be a very good one. So I think you pick your, your tool that you find most useful, you find easiest to use and stick with it, unless you know something comes along that really makes it um, obsolete. A lot of people know about SharpCap. It's either free or a £10 for the pro version. You can do deep sky imaging on that. I personally don't like it for that. Other people do. I find it a bit tricky for that. And if you buy a camera, there's also always um, some form of proprietary software that comes along with it, um, which I don't think are as good as the, the freebies. So the features you'll need in your image capture software, obviously you need to be able to control the camera itself, set the exposure, the gain and the cooling and the binning levels. Um, can you take signal exposures? Um, can you create plans of exposures? So like I want to take 10 images of three minutes each in the red filter or whatever it happens to be, and then the green filter and then the blue filter. So you can set up whole plans for the night and then leave it running and go away. Those are standard features you'll find on most of these um, software, software packages. You want to be able to display the image on the screen and, and adjust it to, to, to check on your, your, your focusing, your histogram levels and so on. So um, you can see what you're actually imaging and adjust the exposures maybe if you need to. Then there's a whole lot of features that are nice to have. Um, if you can control everything from within one piece of software, like your mount control, your focus aid, your auto guiding, your object list, then these are nice uh, features to have within um, your one package and APT does all of that as well. So here's APT, uh, just a quick rundown of uh, how it works and what it looks like. Obviously, the, the, the main window is of the image, the object you're looking at. Um, down the left hand side gives you various bits of information, like the temperature of the, filter, uh, of the camera, the filter you're using, stuff about the moon phase and the twilight conditions and so on. We have a, a log um, box down here uh, telling you what's been happening. The histogram allows you to adjust the brightness level so you can see different parts of the image and check on it and so on. And over this side, we have um, camera controls connecting to the camera, um, setting the image name, setting some exposure values. And this box here allows you to create um, exposure plans here and you, where you create your, the number of exposures, the length of exposures, what filter you're gonna use and so on. Um, one of the other tabs, the gear tab, this allows you to connect to the telescope, your guiding system, your focuser, your filter wheel. Also allows you to do plate solving. If you haven't come across that yet, we'll do more of that in part five. But that um, allows you 
um, you take an image and plate swabbing will tell you exactly what the right essential declination are of the center of that image, which can be incredibly useful for setting up the amount as well as, as finding an object. It can also, if it, if it finds out that you're say a few degrees away from the object you want to look at, it will um, tell the amount to move until it finds it right at the center of your field of view, which is very easy and takes away all the skill of being able to find an object in the sky. Um, also, lots of other tools here, uh, focusing aids, batting off aids, magnifying tools, um, things that help you to create your flats and a whole lot of other things as well. So uh, lots of other features that you may or may not want to use. Um, object framing information down here as well. And the last tab is the image preview. So you can go through all the images that you've taken in the evening and um, look at them on the screen. So that's APT, and I think it's really good, but um, the other ones I've mentioned are also very good as well and hopefully become better over the next year or two, more stable. Okay, where have we got to? Right, um, so you've, we've done all that. You've got everything spot on. You've got the right software, the right kit. You've managed to point at the object you want to do, and that, this night you've taken, let's say you've taken 10 two-minute exposures of the object. So these are your light frames. And maybe they look something like that. So I've chosen the Dumbbell Nebula M27. These were images I took in 2012 with a DSLR, actually. Uh, so that's your, your light frame. So you've kept those. You also need to take your dark frames. Um, so what you've done for that is you've covered the telescope so that there's no light getting in there. You've kept the camera at the same temperature, if at all possible. And the same exposure length, you've taken 10 of those as well. So there should be no image on there apart from the dark, the dark um, current that's the dark information that, that is um, happening at that temperature. And that's what that dark frame looked like. You can see a couple of um, odd pixels, a red pixel and a group, uh, blue, um, green pixel up there. And also to the bottom right, a very nasty bit of um, amplifier glow on the chip, which will be subtracted out of um, the final image. And that's one of the the benefits of dark frames. Um, bias frames, there's nothing much to show for that. Um, basically, you take the shortest possible exposure with a camera with a telescope covered, um, say 0 0.001 seconds, and that should tell you what data is looking around in your sensor when it's not been exposed to anything, and you can subtract that as well. If you're just creating pretty pictures, that's far less important um, than if you're doing scientific imaging. And in this case, on a demo it, I won't actually use any. Um, flats are more important. Um, so flats tell you about how, how the optical system vignettes the data. So the center of the image, let me show you, the center of the image might be quite bright, but right about the outside, it might be slightly darker because of the optical configuration of your telescope or the camera or filters and so on. Um, it also shows up a few of the dust um, bunnies on, on here as well, so it can correct for the for the dust that you're seeing on here as well. So flats are very important. How do you take flats? That's a bit, bit of an art, really. Um, you want it to be bright enough so that you can see uh, the difference in the, the light in the dark areas. But if it's too bright and it's just white, then you've got no information. If it's too dark, then you haven't got enough information. So how do you find that? Um, it's tricky. APT gives you a tool to help you choose that, but basically you'll try a few different sets of exposures and see which one gives you the most information and keep adjusting it till it's about right. You cover your telescope with a white t-shirt or something, or if you've got an electric light panel, white panel, or even a gray sky can do it. And that gives you a nice um, uh, blank field of view. And then you process the data. So, um, I think I'm about to do that. Oh, not quite yet. <laughs> Telling you what you can process it in. Uh, most people have used Deep Sky Stacker for a long time. It was the, the standard free one. Um, uh, probably still is for a lot of people. Something called Nebulosity, which I, I use sometimes. Iris is a free one, a French one, I think. Um, lots of clever stuff in it, but not very easy to use. The interface is pretty terrible, I would say. 
Cyril is the new kid on the block. It's free, and I'm actually going to demo that very shortly. And it's um, it's taken over, I think, from Deep Sky Stacker as maybe the, the best free one around. Star Tools, I know some people might use this. Uh, that, that does a good job on a lot of stuff. I don't think it does stacking, though. I think you stack elsewhere first. Astro Pixel Processor is fairly new. I've used that quite a lot recently, and that's really quite good. Um, and I think probably a lot of people would argue that the very best one is PixInsight. It's probably one of the most expensive. It's also got a terrible uh, user interface, I think, as well. I trialed that and really didn't like it, although it came up with some very good images. Um, I wasn't happy spending time using it, so I'm not using that. Uh, but other people do use it, and they love it. Um, I think after you've used all of those tools, um, it's still a good idea to finish off your images with Photoshop or Lightroom or GIMP is the freebie one, um, just to touch it up for your for your final version. I think it makes a difference still. So those are the logos. Okay, um, so I am going to give you a demo now and I'm going to use Cyril, which you may or may not have heard of before. Um, strange name. Why am I going to use it? Well, it's free, it's new, and it is being actively developed. There's a lot of good stuff going into it at the moment. And it's cross-platform as well, uh, which a lot of things just aren't. So it'll help the, make the, the Mac and Linux users happy as well. It's good for demoing because it's clear what's going on, how you calibrate your data, and you can automate it. You can, there are quite a lot of scripts, or you can just chuck your data at it and say, calibrate it, and it will do it for you. Um, it doesn't always work as you expect. So this time I'm going to demo it without the scripting. And I think it's got better visualization tools than Deep Sky Stacker, which doesn't really have very many at all. So you can see what's going on better. So let's see if we can get this working. No, I can't get at it. So there's Cyril. It's not a very interesting piece of software, uh, looking software anyway, but it actually works pretty well. <laughs> So the first thing we're going to do um, is to ch change our working directory to where we've got the data. And we're going to do that to M27 here. So here you see I've got my data in three directories, the lights, the flats, and the darks. As I said, I'm not going to do bias for this one just to keep the time down, but it, it works exactly the same for biases as well. That's a working directory set. <laughs> Um, Serial works in, in things called sequences. So um, it works with your lights as a sequence, your darks as a sequence, your flats as a sequence as well. Um, so let's, um, the first thing we're going to do, let me this in the way, is we're going to process um, the dark frames. So I'm going to drag over, I've got five dark frames here. So I chose to do this time into the window there. Um, and we're going to give this sequence the name D for darks. What it's going to do now is it's going to um, convert these to FITS files, F-I-T-S, which is um, the file type that Serial works in. If your files are already in FITS format, it probably shouldn't um, convert them. But these are in raw format from a, a Canon a DSLR camera. So I'm going to convert these. And that's going to create a sequence with the um, prefix D underscore. And there's an image preview, which is blank, as you'd expect. But if we were to stretch the gain, we might be able to see something. Not very much, really. So that's now a master dark, I think. The next thing we're going to do is um, we'll clear that out. We're now going to process our flats. So I'll drag the flat frames in exactly the same way. And my prefix is going to be F for flats. And we're going to convert these as well. I haven't used this very often yet, so things may go wrong. <laughs> and that's that done as well. So there you can see the flat, I think. It's strange. You can see a bit of a, a light patch in the center. And the final thing we're going to do here is um, process our light frames. So these are the pictures of the object itself. 
drag these in. I've got 10 of these. I'll call those L. And um, convert those. So it's reasonably fast. It's not very slow at all. If you did this in APP, actually pixel processor, it would take a lot longer to do, but it comes up with slightly better results. And over here, we can see um, the black and white image um, of the object, which is M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. The next thing you want to do is to pre-process those. So what that means is applying the darks and the flats and the bias, which we're not going to use in this case. So here we just choose the, the, ma the, the master dark. We haven't done that yet. So what we've got to do is we've now got to stack those dark frames. Apology. Um, we're going to create a master dark file out of that. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use median stacking. If you hover over, second, let hue in. It'll, it'll give you a, um, is it doing it? No, it's not doing it. We're going to use median stacking for um, dark frames here. Uh, what I need to do is to choose the sequence we're going to use, which is the dark sequence. Uh, we'll stack those. Here we go. So we're going to create an image file called dstack, which is the master dark file. Um, and start stacking. That's uh, stacking all of the five um, dark frames together to make to create one master dark file at the end. And, um, let's create it. Good. And we do the same for um, the flats files. Go to stacking. I'm going to stack those as well. Median stacking. And that will now have created one master flat file. And then we can go back to the pre-processing. Pre so we're going to pre-process our light files using the flat and the dark, uh, massive dark frames. So we'll use these and we'll go and find the files we're going to use. Um, so the dark stacked there and the flat one. Uh, let's see it's that one there. And what's going to happen is, do we need to create a, do we need to collect my sequence? No, no, we don't. And I'm not totally clear on what I'm doing here. <laughs> what we've got down here is cosmetic correction as well. So that's getting rid of all the hot and the cold pixels that might otherwise um, appear all over your image. Um, it's pretty good at doing that. Um, and it's going to end up with image files that are prefixed with PP. What we're also going to do here is to debear the fits images before saving. So that means we're going to, going to convert these black and white images with the red, green, and blue data in there. We're going to convert them into color images so we can actually see the color. And if I forget to do that, we'll end up with black and white images with a strange looking pattern over the top of it, which I've done before. Takes a little bit longer, but not very long. And now we have a color image. Excellent, that worked. So we can now see over here, we've got, we can see the individual channels, the red channel and the green channel and the blue channel. We can see that a lot of the background noise is in the, in the green channel. The red channel is pretty um, black at the back. And that's just why we've got this horrible green um, blur there. So we've pre-processed. Um, we're now going to register these images. So that means um, aligning the images before we stack them. We're going to use um, global deep sky alignment option. There's several options you can use, but that seems to be the best one. Um, so we're going to register those images. So you can see it's actually losing using um, all the stars in the field of view to to, re to align them up. I think that's it done. Fairly fast. And finally, we're going to stack those images now. 
and um, we'll leave everything set as it is, I think. Um, at the end of it, we'll end up with one file with that name there. And there we have it, right. That's it complete. So we'll now open that final file. It's not what's in the field of view. Um, we need to open the fits file. So this image at the bottom is the stacked, calibrated final image. And this is approximately what it looks like. And these are the red, green, and blue channels as before. So um, you can see the image there, it's not too bad, but it's a horrible um, green shade to it. That's partly because I used a light pollution filter on that, which gives a green cast. It may also partly be because um, there's an extra green filter in the chip. I don't know if that contributes to it or not. But one of the good things that Cyril has is the opportunity to get rid of that green hue. Um, there used to be um, a plugin for Photoshop that a lot of people use called HLVG, which stood for Hasta la Vista Green, getting rid of green, um, but I don't think that works anymore. But here we can actually remove the green noise and um, just allow it to do that. And uh, it's done it. It's created blue noise there, of course. <laughs> we can adjust the color levels on that one. Um, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, I'm not going to go too much more into the image processing, processing capabilities of, of Cyril because I haven't investigated them that much. What I wanted to demonstrate there was the, the process of um, calibrating your data with the darks and the flats and the biases, uh, registering it and, flat, uh, and stacking it. But that is the same process you'll go through in pretty much every piece of processing software that, that I mentioned. And um, that's the basics of your image processing. And once you've got your final image, then it's a, it's a matter of taste really on, on how you process that. Um, I'll get that out of the way. We can actually do a bit of processing here if we want to, um, adjusting the colors and things like that. Um, don't know what that's gonna do. Yeah, there we go. Adjusting the backgrounds. And that's ruined it totally, but that's fine. What we're doing here actually though, uh, on this image is we're just adjusting the views. We're not actually adjusting the raw image itself. Um, that will, you'll have to adjust that in your final processing software, such as Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, all we're doing is uh, changing the view. However, if we do like the look of it here, of the tools that we're using, we can then save that image and that could be your final image. And in a lot of cases that will be, that will be good enough. Okay, so that was uh, processing in Cyril. Um, I'm not going to do any more on that because I'm not very expert in it, but I think that demonstrates fairly well how, how you do your calibrating, your stacking. And that particular image, after a lot of tweaking around, that's what it came up with. Um, and that's uh, quite a long time ago I did that with a, just a very basic DSLR, and it worked pretty well. And I'm running out of voice, so um, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> and um, ask if there's any questions. I've got one from YouTube for you, if you want to take that, Mark. Yes, carry on. Um, we have a question from someone describing himself as PT or herself as PT. Mm -hmm. Can you get a UV filter for a CCD camera? I have asked whether he or she was interested in a UV pass or a UV cut filter but I have had no response. I'm assuming it's UV passed for imaging clouds on Venus, maybe? Uh, yeah, pe pe people who image Venus do tend to use the UV pass filters, don't they? Um, you can get both filters, I think, to, to cut, filters to cut out UV and infrared, uh, but you can also get filters that allow infrared through and uh, UV through. So the answer to that is yes, you definitely can. Okay, he yeah, said, yeah, UV cut. Oh, UV cut he was interested in. Um, I think your know, average um, uh, filter that you, if if you're imaging um, with a, a, a camera like these through 
any sort of glass or through a refractor or through a Barlow lens, you need to have some form of infrared cut filter anyway, because yes. infrared cuts are different focus. They tend to have UV cut in there as well, I think a lot of them. So yes. I think that, that becomes as default. Well, the glass will take a lot of the UV out, of course. Yes, yeah, but it also it, it also um, brings it a different focus, yeah. Can I ask a question that isn't anywhere except in my brain? Uh -huh. it, it's much a statement. It's, um, DSLR cameras, in the old days, Nikon cameras didn't perform very well because raw files weren't really raw. A lot of processing was done in the camera and you couldn't stop it. Um, so people went for Canon cameras. I just wonder where we are now with DSLRs and processing in camera and knowing what's going on and stopping it. I think Nikon had a reputation. They had they had a feature in them called the star eater. It would remove stars because it thought there were yes. imperfections. In the chip. I think that's gone now. Um, I'm not a Nikon user. I can't answer that one. But um, Andrew might be able to answer that. He's got a Nikon. Well, uh, I, I have a, a D7000. And, um, uh, part of the issue was that quite a bit of the software wouldn't handle the, is it the NEF files that you get with Nikon. Um, and you had to convert them. So... Uh, um, that I certainly had one or two issues with it. Nikon, I think last year brought out a rather expensive DSLR specifically for uh, astrophotography. Uh, I believe it cost several thousand pounds. Uh, mm. I looked no further. Um, <laughs> um, I think in, in reality, both will produce uh, good, good quality images. The bigger question is, do you want to convert them and um, have the filter changed and make them specifically for uh, astro imaging, or do you want to use them occasionally for astro imaging and occasionally for taking photographs? Yeah. Um, there is a new Canon just come out, of course, in the last couple of weeks, which is a mirrorless astro photography version. Um, it's supposed to be quite good, but I don't know if people have actually used it. One of the problems, I believe, is that it uses CR3. Um, raw files that not much software understands at the moment mm -hmm. just to add to the confusion so you probably have to run it through Canon's Photoshop professional and convert it into TIFF to, before you start yeah. I think a lot of a lot of the Astro software will understand CR3s now I, I don't I don't think it's because it, it's it's not that new is it CR3 I'm not sure uh, I don't know I, I, I don't uh, I might have got that CR3. wrong but I have actually seen I think there's a review in the Astronomy Now or one of those magazines. Yeah, you may that know was, that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's one of the things but, that they said it's a new format. Yeah. The, the problem with the SLRs is you can't chill them as much. You can chill them. You can, people have made um, chillers for them, but the um, astro cameras generally are made to be chilled. Um, the SLRs aren't, so that can cause issues. Yeah. We have a question uh, from John O. John o, would you like to ask his question or do you want me to ask it? Um, yeah, no, I can ask. Um, I've just got a, a Canon myself, and it's got a mode, a sort of noise reduction mode, where it, where it takes an automatic dark after the main image and subtracts that. And I think you just get a, a resulting raw um, with the two subtracted. I just yep. wonder whether that's you, worth using or whether it's better just like taking your own darks. I think a lot of DSLRs have had that in for a long time. Yeah, anything over a certain exposure length, it will do that, that for you. You can turn that off. The reason you might not want to do that is because um, it will do it after every frame. So if you're taking 50 frames, then you'll probably end up uh, taking twice the amount of time, whereas you can take one, maybe 10 dark frames and use those afterwards. And that, you, know, you don't need as many dark frames as, as you do light frames, generally speaking. So it's... Um, I don't totally know what the processing method is um, when, when you apply the dark frames in the camera. Um, so maybe it's better. I think it's probably better to do it yourself in the software so you know exactly what's going on. But some people do do it that way. I, I certainly don't. A lot of people don't. Yeah. One thing about the dark frame in the camera, of course, it only uses a single dark frame, so you don't get the noise reduction, I believe, unless the software's got even cleverer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if, if you take your 10 dark frames yourself, that's 10 dark frames you can use on every single light frame. Yes. As each light frame will only use one dark frame, you're right, yeah. 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 Uh, Ian, cool. did, um, sorry, Ian, did you have something to say, I thought? Um, well, I've, I've put a link up on the chat, which is um, a YouTube uh, video 
of uh, this new uh, Canon mirrorless camera in astronomy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. So you, you may be able to see the link on the on the chat. Yes, it's on there. Yep. I'm the chat person today. It appears <laughs> YouTube chat. Um. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Um, about PhD. Um, Mark, from your slide, it showed that there was a, at the beginning, it was like a, a squiggly line and then it settled down when it educated itself. How long did it take before it works out where it is and to, to settle down into the guiding? It, it can be, um, it, well, it depends on the, the, the conditions of the night. It's trying to work out what's um, the atmospheric effect and what's the, the amount itself. It can be just a minute or two, really. It can um, sometimes it's to uh, work straight away. It'd be nice and smooth straight away, right. but it doesn't take long at all. It's pretty clever, yeah, pretty smart. Okay, thanks. Is that an option that you select? Because I, I wasn't aware that it did that. Of what? Sorry, the <clears throat> in PhD two is that an option you need to select? Because I wasn't aware that it did that. Yeah, it, it's. You can choose how much of the history it uses to inform its um, its mount cal uh, calculations, its mount um, corrections. I think you can uh, get it to choose the previous, you know, ten to fifty or one hundred percent of it, or whatever it happens to be, and say use that to inform my next set of corrections. But I think it automatically learns. I think it just does it in, inside, and you can see it getting better over a period of time. Or, or I certainly can, anyway. Right. Neil, you want to ask your question? Um, yep. Do do all the frames, so the light frames and all the, the various calibration frames, do they have to be the same um, dimensions, uh, binning level and bit depth for the processing to work? Usually, yes. Um, if you've forgotten sometimes, so you take your your dark frames at two by two, then you can <laughs> You can double them up, you can increase them in size, resize them, but it's not the best way to do it. So ideally, you keep them all the same dimensions and depth and, and bidding levels. The software will certainly throw up its hands if they are different. Help with errors. Good, thank you. Not just me then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from anybody on the questions front? One thing I was just going to say is the flats, of course, have to be taken if you rotate the camera at all to get a better frame of the image you need to take a new set of flats you don't need you a new do, set yes. of darks but your flats yeah. obviously depend on your camera orientation yeah certainly you, you should do your flats as soon afterwards you can because even moving the telescope can dislodge dust and then you've lost the ability to remove any dust uh, from your pictures using the, the flat frames so yeah exactly that and uh, Cyril, your final output image, can you save it as, say, a, a TIFF? In, in Cyril, yes, you can do that. Um, we were seeing the stretched image on the screen, but that was just the, for viewing purposes. When you save it as a, a TIFF or whatever, I think there are various options. It, it, it'll, when you bring it up, it'll be pretty, pretty blank. You'll have to start stretching it all over again. But I think it's better to do that in another tool than in Cyril. However, Cyril did come up with some very nice images in the end itself, and saving it, saving the stretched image direct from Cyril was actually um, pretty nice itself. So, um, and I think there's an awful lot of stuff in there that I haven't explored yet that um, you can get rid of light pollution gradients, you do sharpening, um, contrast enhancement, a whole load of things that you don't get in Deep Sky Stacker, for example. Um, and for a lot of people, it may be good enough by itself and as they're adding in a lot more features, it will become a lot better, I think. I don't know how far it's going to go, but it's, it's looking pretty good so far. Well, one thing I was just going to mention, Mark, that you didn't actually say is you should never use JPEG files because they're compressed and a lot and lose some of the information and do all sorts of strange things. Um, you always have to use either raw files, fixed files, or uncompressed TIFF files if you want to to do yeah. something sensible with the data. Yeah, yeah. Anything that, that doesn't lose data is important. Um, FITS files are the, seems to be the astronomical standard, I think, for a lot of these things. Um, and if you bring in raw files to the CR2 raw files there from Canon, it converted them to FITS anyway. Um, so you don't lose any information there. But yeah, spot on with that. Your yeah. only problem is that the, the color FITS 
files are not really a standard and there's different interpretations of what happens with them. So you open them in some software and very strange things happen. Um, so I haven't seen any strange things, but maybe there are, yes. <laughs> yep. So we'll go through a lot, a lot more of the detail that, uh, that, that we've done today in, in our imaging group meeting. So anyone who wants to know more, join the society in our imaging group. That's where we do all this stuff. Well, thanks very much, Mark. That was, that was um, um, as I say, a fairly large serving <laughs> uh, tonight. Um, um, and convinces me while I, while I, I think I'll stick with the uh, EAA. <laughs> um, this hardcore stuff is, uh, is, is, is quite technical and involved. And the, the images are wonderful at the end. Um, <laughs> they can be. Time, <laughs> time, the patience and the skill. Um, next time, um, not having been put off by uh, having to put all the work in for um, part four, Mark has kindly volunteered um, for part five. So if you're interested in, in uh, imaging for science projects, the exoclock, the hoys that we've, uh, we've had talks about, um, tune in and um, Mark will be taking us through some of the finer points uh, of, uh, of imaging for those particular purposes. Um, and I think and that's it um, for um, members. We have a meeting on Friday. Um, I'm told I'm going to have to make some of the questions easier in the quiz. Um, <laughs> you may be glad to hear. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you then. If you're interested in um, joining, the society, joining the society, then please go to the website. There's plenty of time to join between now and Friday, and you too can take part in the quiz. <laughs> Uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.